Jumping on to the presentation of Norbit, uh, then uh, what you see here is um, the organization of the Norbit Group. So the company is established in 1995, so it's, uh, it's not a completely new company. It's been around for, for 20 years uh, this year. Last year's revenue, or 2013, so technically it's two years ago, uh, was uh, $75 million. Uh, I don't have the numbers for last year, but uh, it's a relatively sizable company. We have more than 150 employees, and uh, it's split over five different um, parts of the company. Can you see my mouse? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll just start with uh, ODM. ODM is what it started with uh, many years ago, or in 1995. And uh, the activities within that part of the company is to develop technology for other companies. So those other companies could be Kongsberg, which would like to have a watertight security sonar or a part of a watertight security sonar. It could be a radar system, it could be a downhole multi-beam system. Um, so they've developed and they develop a lot of different um, high-end uh, technical solutions for different companies. So when, when you have that type of business model, then, that's, then typically what happens is that you're developing uh, these uh, nice products and then you give it to the clients and then the clients is, is successfully selling them. And maybe when the volume gets bigger, then they're planning to produce them themselves or produce them another place. So it was strategically decided uh, quite a number of years ago to, to try to also set up an own product company. And the first one which was set up is what's called ITS. So this this middle box I'm, I'm showing here. And uh, it's called Intelligent Traffic Systems. So that is uh, a roughly 10, 15 years old division, which have been relatively successful in penetrating the market of radar-based uh, traffic control systems. So they have a radar uh, interrogator and then they have a small device in the front windscreen of the car and uh, those are sold in very many different parts of the world. So the technology Norbit uh, uh, produces and designs is the, the radar interrogator uh, sitting uh, over the cars and then uh, the, the small devices sitting in each individual cars. So they've produced more than a million of uh, or several million of these uh, in-car devices. And then the next <coughs> box here called EMS. That is uh, a part of the company which is producing high-end electronics in relative moderate quantities. So they, we, we own two different companies in Norway uh, producing for companies like Kongsberg or EMTS producing some of their electronics. Uh, we also have three people in uh, China where they, they, whenever the volumes are bigger, they, then they'll uh, source them in China. But it's, there is no production, uh, no bit owned production in China. It's only a sourcing office. And then I'll move on to Quickna before I'm going back to Subsea. Quickna uh, is not 100% owned by the Norbit Group, but uh, there is a substantial amount of Kvigna uh, owned by, by Norbit Group. And it's a company based in Reykjavik in Iceland. And they're doing nothing but signal processing and software development. 
so they are a very important uh, part of what uh, our activities within the subsea division, what, uh, what they are doing. So they have uh, roughly 15 to 20 people, uh, and most of them uh, holds PhD uh, degrees or master degrees and uh, are specialized in, in signal processing. And maybe not to the same extent software development, but they also do uh, software development. But the, the really strong point is really signal processing. So jumping to <clears throat> what we're going to talk about uh, today is the subsea division. <clears throat> and uh, that was established probably four or five years ago. And uh, they had developed a subsea multi-beam ecosounder uh, platform, I would say, before I joined three years ago. But really, three years ago is when it all started to be a little bit more serious uh, in that division, and we started to define some different products. And this slide shows a zoom-in of the activities within the subsea group. So we have products we're going to discuss in some uh, details today, forward-looking sonars and bathymetry sonars. So that's going to be our main emphasis. So the forward-looking sonars can detect what is in front of the sonar quite far away. It depends on the, uh, the different configuration of the sonars. But from very, very close, less than a half a meter, to some of the results we're going to discuss today is more than 400 meters away detection of hydrocarbon in the water column. In this case, uh, I put in a, a funny slides here, which this is actually, you can see this is a shadow of a whale, which was detected by the forward-looking sonar some time ago. The next box here is bathymetry sonar. So these are standalone uh, multi-beam echo sounders really designed to conduct detection of where is the seafloor. So these are turned down towards the seafloor and then um, the end result is uh, what you see here. I'm sure Pala have shown you some examples of what's called the DTM, so digital terrain models. Um, so this could have been done with uh, either, I'm not sure this is done uh, with either software but uh, basically, that's, that's the output of a bathymetry sonar. I would say this bathymetry sonar is also the sonar we have typically used in some of our work with uh, companies like Chevron to detect hydrocarbon leakages very far away. Because the advantage of this system compared to this one is that it's a very narrow and very focused transmit energy, which gives us better control of where the sound is going, and also better signal-to-noise ratio uh, when we are receiving the reflections of a hydrocarbon plume. Then we pioneered, maybe two, two and a half years ago, uh, we pioneered very tight integrations of GNSS INS technology, so positioning technology on surface vessels with multi-beams. So in this case, it's what we call our IVBMS-C compact where there is an INS system inside uh, the transmit subsystem, actually is inside here. And then uh, we have GPS antennas on the top. So all you need in order to have a turnkey system to, to produce these maps is one of these systems and then a laptop with IVA software on it. And then you can go out and do uh, bathymetry uh, surveys. So the last <clears throat> the last part of uh, subsea is what we call solutions. So this is uh, probably what we're going to discuss the most today. And uh, we have a quite extensive uh, experience with uh, working with oil companies and uh, different uh, people interested in detection of hydrocarbon, either in fluid form or in gas form in the water column. So the next slide. Next slide here shows the references within only the solutions uh, part of uh, what we've worked with. You can see there's quite a lot of 
different major oil companies. Uh, some of them we worked with for quite some time, uh, quite a lot. Uh, Chevron, for instance, we're going to see some results from the two, uh, the last two years' uh, results with Chevron, where we've uh, focused on resident leaks detection uh, with them. We have a couple of other projects ongoing right now we're going to discuss, and the latest project we're just starting on now is a AUV integration of putting this technology on AUVs. So we did the first trial late last year and we're moving towards the next trials here in the first week of uh, March. Both of them uh, done on a Bluefin uh, AUV. So the one we used last year was a 12D and we're going to use one a little bit bigger this year, the 21D, or exactly the biggest they have. So this uh, this uh, illustration shows uh, shows a phenomenon which takes place uh, less than five kilometers from where I'm I'm sitting right now, and uh, it's it's good to illustrate what we can do with active acoustics. This is an area where there is natural occurring fractures in the oil reservoir. So let's start with the oil reservoir down here. There is overpressure here, and then there is fractures, and then there is natural occurring seeps into the ocean. So that's something where you are, uh, when when you are looking into areas where you want to drill for oil, then one of the, the important sort of indications of whether there is and where there is oil in the in the uh, in the seabed is uh, natural occurrence, either gas or oil or a mixture thereof uh, seeps from the seabed. So you can find them using the bathymetry system uh, and using water column analysis or just looking for potholes and things like that on the seafloor. But what happens outside here uh, in uh, Coal Point, it's called, is that there is a mixture of gas, primarily gas, I would say, which comes up many, many places, and then the methane gas goes up uh, to the surface, and then it, of course, is released to the atmosphere, and then there is also oil droplets. So this process here where there is leakages either in gas or in fluid form, we could put a sonar right here on a tripod and monitor that in real time. So detection of of any plume of gas or any plume of uh, fluid is detectable by active acoustics. We need an alternative way of verifying that it really is oil. We can detect there is an impedance difference, but we cannot for sure say whether it's uh, oil. Of course, if it looks like a gas uh, seep, then it's very likely that it is a gas seep. Uh, it's very easy to detect gas seeps. Oil plumes is a little bit more difficult. It could be plankton or, or other things which is uh, um, moving around in the water column. But typically, fluid plumes is also relatively easy to detect uh, and verify that it really is oil. So what happens out here is that the oil is not as heavy as it could be. You see here there is a heavy oil seep. So if it is a oil type, uh, the so-called grade 5 type oils, they will not go to the surface. They will actually stay down because they are heavier than water. But most oils will go to the surface. And then on the surface, we can detect using um, active uh, multi-beam technologies, we can detect uh, presence of oil on the surface, but typically there is other technologies which are more efficient doing that, like radar detection or uh, just flying over with a helicopter. So really, the big advantage of active acoustics is that you can detect it at the source, you can detect it subsea, but because there could be four kilometers and it could move very far away before it's seen on the surface or maybe it, it's never reaching the surface. That's many times the, the case with gas leakages. 
then what happens typically is that the, <coughs> the weathering process starts and then at some point the lighter uh, petroleum hydrocarbons uh, evaporates to the atmosphere and then it starts to sink down and then it will land on the seabed. And there we could also detect it using a bathymetry system and then use what's called bottom classification in order to verify where is this oil situated on the seabed. So <clears throat> to conclude on this slide, we can detect gas very easy. We can detect oil plumes. It's a little bit more difficult depending on how big they are and which type of oil. In the water column, that is where we are primarily focusing and on the seabed. It could also be on the surface if it's ice covered because then you cannot detect it with radar or any other technologies. Then you have to have an AUV sailing underneath the ice in order to detect the oil on the ice water surface. I'm going to show you some examples of, of data from that as well. <clears throat> this shows a little bit more data, data not necessarily from oil detection, but a digital terrain model. This is roughly 90 meters deep hole, and then this is relatively shallow, the red. A car here upside down, a forward-looking sonar on a rotator, and some example of forward-looking data here, and again, more bathymetry data. But I'll move on to some of the projects uh, we're going to discuss today. Uh, there is one here which we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail than, than the ones on the list here. That's the Chevron trials from last year. But I'll just go through uh, very fast this list, and then I'll slow show one slide uh, per uh, line here. The first project we have uh, on the list here is a project we have ongoing as we speak, where we're doing a data fusion, fusion in 3D slash 4D between an interferometric laser system and uh, acoustic, our acoustic uh, 3D slash 4D uh, sonar system. That's funded by BESI. BESI is the governmental regulatory uh, entity here in North America deciding what the oil companies can do and cannot do. So this is a rather high profile uh, project uh, which is planned to be complete by very late this year. We're doing the integration uh, now in March and uh, doing the in-water test before summer and then the offshore test uh, in September, October time frame. August 2014 uh, to September 2015, so it's still ongoing. We have a project which is funded by OGP. They just changed their na name to IOGP. So OGP is oil gas producers in London. So most oil and gas producers uh, have a membership in OGP. And uh, then a subset of those members might decide that they want to investigate certain topics. And uh, one of the hot topics for a lot of these oil companies is what are we going to do with the, the activities we are planning to have where there is partial ice cover either all the time or uh, part of the year. So this project is uh, looking into that and uh, we are currently in the melting phase where we have uh, our sonars uh, mounted under uh, almost one meter thick uh, ice sheen in, uh, here in New Hampshire in, in North America. Then we had a project which is complete uh, last year, funded by uh, US Coast Guard, so US Coast Guard here. And the prime objective there was to detect very low concentrations of oil in the water column which this was identified as, as a problem after the McCandle spill where people uh, saw that they, they had oil coming up on the beaches and they really thought it was impossible because they applied a lot of subsea dispersant and also collected and put dispersants on the surface. But nevertheless, the oil managed to migrate into the water column and be transported to the beaches. And that mechanism happened in the water column because the uh, droplet sizes of the oil 
were so small that they stayed suspended in the water column. And the, the concentration is relatively low, so the, the objective of this project is to demonstrate a detection method based on active acoustics. I'm going to show you some data from that, uh, that as well. Then uh, there is uh, some results from the 2013 uh, campaign on leakage detection trials with uh, Chevron. I'm going to show just one slide here. I have a much bigger uh, set of slides for that, which I don't plan to show today. Then we did in uh, February last year, we did a, a deployment of our technology on the ice in, um, in Michigan. Again, it was US Coast Guard funded. It was on a US Coast Guard vessel. August uh, 2012, we worked closely together with Exxon Mobile to use active acoustics to uh, figure out how efficient this dispersion um, worked on real salt water and real heavy crude oil. So that was done in a test facility here where, where we had real crude oil in, in, in the water. Then we did in 2012 some gas detection trials with Petrobras, and uh, we did in 2011 some offshore trials here on Coal Point, which we've just seen uh, some of the mechanisms happening there. So Bessie, <clears throat> I'll go through this. I'm not going to read everything up. Uh, Bessie is the funding organ, and uh, it's basically the objective is to do oil detection with a combined fluorescence polarization instrument a laser-based instrument and a wideband multi-beam. So the multi-beam, the purpose of the multi-beam is to detect in a very big volume where is the oil plume and then use the fluorescence polarization instrument to verify, yes, it is certainly oil. So the laser system cannot uh, detect as far away as an ac ac active acoustic system and also it cannot uh, visualize the the 3 slash 4D water volume fast enough to be able to use that as the primary uh, sensor. We are in the middle of, uh, of this project right now. The second slide here is showing our OGP project. And uh, this is uh, a couple of months ago. This was, I can see in November when we started the freezing phase. So these patches here, we released crude oil underneath these patches at various uh, different points of time in the growth phase of the ice. So the ice was grown from here, it's relatively thin, uh, to almost a meter thick. And we had a rail system going back and forth underneath here, uh, doing surveys more or less every day in order to detect the, the oil and the behavior of the oil. There's quite a lot of very high profile universities involved in this as well, Woods Hole Institute, I'm sure you know. And uh, this was all conducted in the Cold Regions Research uh, Lab, Krell, in uh, New Hampshire. So that's part of the US Corps of Engineers. So right now we're in the melting phase. It's not melted yet. Uh, we expect that we are going to have the final report out by uh, by June, July, and maybe it's public available by September or something like that. This shows some results of um, the plumes we sent out here. This is the two different sonars. This is a rotator, and here is a bathymetry sonar with a very narrow transmit, and this is a forward-looking sonar, which we saw in, in the pre previous slide. And this is a plume, and what you see here is actually a 3D visualization of one point in time of that plume. So what you see is that, the, that this red here is higher reflectivity, the blue here is when it starts to be water, and this is around 20 ppm concentration, including dispersion. So you see the particle distribution here is around 40 micrometer for the droplet size. So this was a relatively um, successful trial we had uh, here doing uh, measurements on real oil. 
And I'm going to show a little bit of the results from our 2013 leakage detection trials with uh, Chevron. And during the 2013 trial, we had a rotator, and then the primary instrument was this sonar, which is a 200 kilohertz prototype sonar, and we used the rotator to rotate up and down in order to generate the three-dimensional imagery of uh, the plumes. I'm going to show you a little bit more in detail how this works when we move to the next presentation. So I won't spend too much time here. So we deployed uh, this off a pier and uh, did uh, measurements to see how much we could, uh, or how well we detected uh, the plumes. And then we also went uh, offshore and detected it on coal point on some of the natural or current uh, seeps there. Some examples of uh, data. So this is what we call in the sonar world, we call a wedge. So it's because it looks like a one quarter of a circle here. And what you see from this point and output is that the, the narrow transmit beam starts to interact with the seabed. So this is seabed reflection. So you see here is a stone which is reflecting quite a bit. There's a lot of small reflectors here. And what you see here is a gas plume. And the gas plume, of course, when you're hitting that, then there is a shadow behind the gas plume. So what happens when we're doing a 3D is that we're scanning this wedge up and down in order to generate a three-dimensional visualization of what the plume looks like. That's absolutely necessary in order to keep a low signal to no, or a low false alarm rate because it could be a fish we're detecting or it could be a false uh, echo. So having these three-dimensional or four-dimensional uh, data is absolutely necessary in order to be able to, to do a good job on the automatic alarm generation. So what you see down here is more or less the same, except this is illustrating what the alarm function is doing. Here the alarm is escalating in one particular layer is uh, detecting the red dots here is uh, detecting the gas leak. So you see it's the only place where anything is detected. So that's a built-in function in the sonar and it will detect in each of these 2D slices it will detect the, the, the leakage, in this case a gas leak. And then the topside processing software or it could be subsea, we'll see that a little bit later, is then using those 2D information uh, in 3D to verify and escalate to an alarm level if uh, the software thinks it's an alarm. This shows the vertical sonar where it's a good example of what, what uh, a leak looks like if you look at on not the horizontal view but the vertical view. And this is the seabed you see here. And then you see a gas leak going to the surface. Here's an example of a release of a little bit uh, bigger volume of gas. So you see a plume here on its way to the surface. This is a 2013 long range test where we had around 200 meters of range at 200 kilohertz of gas leaks. This is an example of um, a 3D still shot uh, taken 2013, again, Chevron data, roughly 50 meters from the sonar. So the sonar is sitting on the seabed, and the sonar is two meters over the seabed and then going up and down. And what you see here is the interaction with the seabed. So this is the seabed. What you see here is our subsea template where the water is, uh, or we used, in this case, we used fresh water instead of oil because, of course, since this was an open uh, test on a pier in, in the ocean, we could not send out oil. So we used fresh water. So that's definitely worst case uh, compared to if it had been oil. So it's very difficult to detect the impedance differences between the fresh water and salt water. But nevertheless, that's what we see here, that there is a plume being sort of assembled here close to the seabed. And then this plume had at some point in time before 
left the seabed and on its way to the surface. The surface is up here. And the reason why this is now leaving and going to the surface is because the fresh water is a little bit lighter than salt water. So at some point when this is big enough, it will start to go towards the surface. What you see here, this is another one which is now almost fully dissolved into the salt water, so we cannot see it anymore. So typically, depending on the flow rate, we'll be able to see a fresh water leak maybe up to three, four, five meters off the seabed, but then it's fully dissolved into salt water due to the salt water movements and uh, the dissolving process. Of course, the bigger the flow rate, the longer it will stay. In this case, we're at 24 liters a minute. And you also see here why it's important to understand the three-dimensional elements. Because if we only had a 2D, we would only see one slice in, for instance, here. If we were looking here, then we will conclude right now, oh, there is no leak. And then in a little while, we'll see this plume will separate from the seabed and then start to come out. Oh, now we have a leak. And then at some point, it will stop being a leak. So having this 3D information is absolutely important uh, in order to be able to have uh, any alarm, a robust alarm. This is some examples of <clears throat> an under-ice deployment uh, we did in, uh, in February 2013. We had the sonar here looking up towards the ice surface. This is the bathymetry of uh, part of the ice. And a forward looker here was looking up where you see this is uh, forward-looking data. Again, funded by the US Coast Guard. This is some of the examples from uh, the Olmsted uh, test with uh, ExxonMobil, where we had a tank where we had very heavy oil dropped on the surface. So here is it before dispersion was applied, and here dispersion is starting to work, and it's starting to migrate into the water column. This is what you see here, the, the oil is starting to migrate into the water column. Some gas leak is detection. I'm not going to show a lot of these data, but we, can, we could, in this instance, we detected single small bubbles uh, going through from the seabed here or the bottom of the tank to the surface here. Again, automatic detected. Here we had a two sonar set up as well. Gas detection trials again, two, two, uh, two setups. I'll show you a little bit more data from this because this was also in uh, 2014. So this was presentation of some of the experience we have. Uh, I'll switch to another presentation now, which is um, should be ready. So now we're diving in to, to understand a little bit more in details uh, how this active acoustic uh, system works and show you a little bit more results. And uh, this is a paper I did in Houston uh, not so long ago in November last year. During probably the, the, the biggest uh, subsea leakage detection hack, uh, conference in the world, I was invited to do a paper and show our experiences from the trials in 2013-2014 with Chevron. And uh, it took place in Houston. So the organization of this is uh, a little description of what is the Norbit group. We're going to jump over that because we already talked about that. And then a peer test set up. We're really the objective of the peer test also in 2014 was to establish what is the performance envelope of an active acoustic system. This is typically what uh, our installation looked like. We had a couple of different installation heights, a couple of different sonar systems. In this case, it's actually the old 2013 sonar system on a rotator. And we had, in this case, uh, the acoustic modem here. We moved that a little bit further up at a later point. Here is subsea batteries. Here is a subsea processing bottle. We're going to take a little bit more look at that. 
And then number the third part of this presentation is going to discuss some of the more resident leakage detection elements of this. I'll jump over this. And then go uh, straight to the peer test. So remember the objective of this is to, to find out what um, what the detection thresholds uh, would be for for gas and uh, fluid in fluid leakages uh, under controlled uh, environment condition. So what you see out here is an old, it's actually an oil and gas installation. Uh, so it was uh, Conoco Phillips which uh, had this uh, until maybe 20 years ago, where they donated this whole facility to a university. Uh, north, uh, up north from here, and this pier is almost one kilometer long. And out here we have a um, a, st a structure. There's a lamp here, and there is a crane here, another crane here. So we have a boat. In this case, we have a support boat here, and we also worked out on the other side here. So we deployed the solar tripod from one of the cranes on uh, one of these sites. And then we had a support boat which could move the leakages in and out here or over on the other side. The water depth here is roughly 12 meters or 36 feet. And that was uh, clearly a limitation of the performance. But if you want to have a controlled environment, then you're not going to get much deeper water than 12 meters anywhere. So we had to sort of uh, live with that. So the equipment we used, I'm going to discuss that a little bit, we had a water and water. So this is a fuel dragster water pump, which is not very high pressure, but uh, capable of quite high volumes. So you see the dimensions of the piping here is rather big in order to avoid having flow losses. And then we could pump out till 66 meters away from the pump, uh, we could pump up till 50 liters a minute of fresh water. This is our compressor system uh, where we had a dual compressor set up so we could uh, put in roughly 24 liters a minute of, of gas subsea, uh, depending a little bit on the water depth, uh, or 48. It depends on whether we run both of the compressors or just one. Also, we could adjust the flow rate by adjusting the drive voltage. So typically we'll have this on the surface pumping water down and here again gas again on the surface and then pumping gas down. This is the template we use to uh, inject the gas or the fluid. So we, we during our 2013 first leg we experienced quite a, a lot of problems with our injection system because we had acoustic strong reflections from it. So we designed this stealthy subsea template. So when the acoustic waves hit this, this is absorbing material and it's done so all the energy is reflecting away. So the leaks comes out here and they comes out undisturbed on the seafloor because we wanted to make sure we're not quantifying whether we can detect a subsea structure or we can detect a subsea plume. So it's very important for us to have uh, a clear view of the plume, and we succeeded to have this with this design. Up here, the two different sonars. This is uh, the 2013 setup, and uh, we have transmit uh, system here, receiver here, and then we have a vertical sonar here. Primarily, we use that for alignment purposes, so that was not the prime instrument. A rotator, which can rotate this both pan it horizontal and, and uh, scan up and down the three dimensions. So during the 2013 experiment, we, we saw that we had limitations of acoustic nature. Uh, so we built a custom built receiver, which you see here, uh, with much better performance than the previous generation. And then this transmitter is an electronic steerable transmitter. So as you can see here, there is no road data. So the steerability is done electronically. So for a subsea installation, 
you want to minimize the amount of mechanical uh, devices moving things back and forth. So it's really not very feasible to have a mechanical rotator. And also, we have a chance of controlling the acoustics quite a bit more efficient when we have electronic steerability. So that was why this was built and it was very, very successful. I'll show the results. We roughly doubled uh, all performance parameters in 2014 due to this system design. Again, vertical sonar here just to help. Same tripod. Typical setup. <clears throat> so we will have the sonar sitting here. Uh, the observation height here of the sonar is roughly two meters off the seabed. We could put it four meters up or five meters up, but we we wanted to keep it relatively low because when you install this as, as a resident leaks detection system, the bigger it is, the more complicated it is to install. So two meters was the was what we choose for for most of the of the work. Then typically we'll have the subsea template here and then we'll inject either gas or fluid leaks into the <coughs> template and have a hose system going to the boat where we then had the compressor or the water injection system. And then we had a wire going up to the pier, typically. This shows the same again. I'll not, I'll not uh, dwell on that, but this uh, is then the results from the gas, so what you see here, 2013 results, we had a gas leak right here, which is just around 210 meters out. In this case, the boat is here, and it's sending out a 24 liters a minute gas leak, so it's not a big leak, and it's detected here at 460 meter. You see here the signal to noise ratio is actually pretty good. So this is the white line here is showing how much energy comes back as a function of range. You see here 460 meters and you see here the blip, this is the gas, uh, the gas being detected. So this is some 3D information showing what the what a gas leak typically looks like. This is 32 meter range, so a little bit shorter range. And here we just had the subsea template right here, and we turned off the air. So we basically just put one second of air in, so that's roughly 0 0.6 liters of air. And you see the air is here, uh, and you can see the reflectivity is sort of blurry. This is a semi-transparent surface. And you see here there is more reflectivity here on the surface than on the bottom because there's roughly 10 meters difference between the bottom and the top, so that's one atmosphere, so the bubbles will be double the size on the top side than on the bottom. So therefore, with gas, we would expect to get more and more reflectivity as the bubbles is uh, growing. I'll not show this one, this is the more or less the same. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you the importance and a little bit about how this electrical steerability works. So we have the tripod sitting here, and then we want to make sure that we know whether this is actually a leak or this is just a fish in one particular layer. So we're steering the beam up and down. So if you now look at this, um, I'll see if this works. Yeah. So you will see this should run. It should uh, do this. So you see here, you see this yellow thing there, which is now going out. This is the, the, the fan sweeping up. You see now we're illuminating the plume. You can see that in the middle of this, the yellow reflectivity. And then in a little while, you can start to see that the surface reflection comes in up top. Yeah, here you see the surface reflection is coming in. And you see the plume is almost gone now. And now it starts to scan down again. So you see now the plume is, is uh, clearer and you see it's scanning down and you can see the rope going out. Actually, it's not the rope, it's the feeding hoses going down. You can see that line behind it and then you see the interaction with the seabed again. So this is the mecha mechanism we're using in order to generate the four-dimensional. So 
we take one one frame is when you've done this one once. <clears throat> I'll just just show you the. I think maybe this one we have seen. So what the importance is. So you see here we can steer this up and down. One of the things we could do in 2014, we could control the level of side loops here to a very low level. So they interfered much less with the seabed and that improved the ranges quite significantly. I'll just show you this one. So what you see here is the seabed. So you remember you just saw this scanning up and down. So this is the end result of of the scanning process. So this is the surface. So geometrically it's not completely uh, correct, but this is the surface. This is the seabed. We have the subsea template just around here. And then these different scatters in the water column is side loops in the water column, which is stationary. So they are not detected as leaks. So I'll just run this a couple of times. So you see now we're starting and you'll see the a small blob will blob here. And then the flow starts to flow, and you see here, this is a fresh water <coughs> leak uh, starting to uh, come into the water column. Again, start again. This is a fish. What you see here is the first blob, and then it starts to flow. So this is assembled by a couple of these scans up and down. I think there is 10 or 15 or something like that. So the main purpose of this visualization is to understand the mechanism because you can see this is now fully gone in the water column, in the roughly mid water column. So you need to you need to be able to detect it very close to the seabed, otherwise you'll not detect this fresh water leak. A oil leak would be quite significantly easier to detect because they will continue all the way to the surface as it is not going to mix into the water column. It's going to stay as an oil plume. Water and water detection. <coughs> uh, we had roughly a two times increase. So you remember uh, this slide we had here. 2013, we had a roughly 50 meter ranges. In the 2014 with the optimized system, we here detected a water leak with 24 liters at 117 meters of range. So water and water detections in the order of, for relevant leakages, in the order of 100 meters under good conditions, and gas uh, leakages in the order of 450 meters. We could probably detect it further away. Our limit, the shallow water was due to bay bending in the water column. So it was not, it was not due to the acoustics uh, not working anymore. So it was an environmental factor which actually controlled the performance of the, the gas leakage. At deeper water, we could probably get a little bit more than 460 meters. This is an example of what happens if we have very, 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 very small flow rates. Then we can only detect it 10 tens of meters away. And what happens with water is that due to the very low flow rate, it mixes into the salt water very close to the seabed. So here, yeah, we can see it, but we, we cannot see it very much further than this with two liters a minute. But two liters a minute is also next to nothing. Then we moved uh, offshore. So this is the last part of this presentation. And uh, we wanted to test this in a real life environment. And we wanted, maybe more importantly, to test the operational aspects of deploying a fully autonomous uh, battery operated uh, subsea detection system. So here is an example of where we've deployed it. We actually, in this case, had a small buoy uh, with a radio uh, full data link going back to the boat. We'll come back to some results where we didn't have that. Here is the system. You can see the we used the old 2013 system here with the rotator. This is the battery, subsea battery package, which could run it for eight hours. This is the subsea processing. This is the acoustic modem, which we'll, we'll see a little bit of the results on 
how it's uh, generating automatic alarms and then sending an alarm up to the surface. This is what this, uh, the surface of the water looks like uh, nearby these natural seeps. So you see here the lighter uh, oil oils are starting to burn off. Uh, this is in the morning, so in the morning it's it's uh, it's it's quite easy to see because it's assembled oil overnight, and then as the sun is burning it off, it it will disappear, and then it will be assembled again the next night. We had an ROV uh, present as well, so we'll see some results from the ROV. <coughs> so this is one of the big seeps, it's called trilogy seep. So you see here a massive amount of methane gas, 24-7, uh, coming up from the seabed, natural occurring. So the reason why it's called trilogy is because this is one seep, and then you can see the next one is coming in here, and you can just see the last one down here. It's a relatively big, uh, big seep, so that's very, 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 very easy to detect from the tripod. So we deployed the tripod a couple of hundred meters off and, and did 3D scanning of, of this, but compared to what we did on the pier where we had a very small single stream, 24 liters a minute, then this is trivial to detect. The other ROV picture here is from a much, much smaller is probably 50 or 100 liters a minute. So again, much bigger than what we did on the pier. Uh, this is the crater at a little bit deeper water where the methane gas is coming up from the seabed. And you can see here this primarily gas. So there is in these two places that we didn't have much oil mixed in and it's very difficult to see the oil from the cameras. I would judge that this is probably 10 times bigger leak rates than what we detected uh, on the pier, maybe 5 to 10 times bigger. Then the, the main objective of this uh, trial was really to deploy a full autonomous setting. So the tripod is sitting down here and it's rest and leak detection. So this, what we're simulating here, is a drill ship. And then in this case, we are injecting a gas leak subsea. And then hopefully our observing system here, which is way off the, the drill location, is going to detect this and then send an acoustic modem uh, alarm up. And uh, remember that it's this 2D slice which is scanning up and down. In this case, we're showing a 90 degree sector, but it might as well scan 360 degrees all around this point. So also over here, uh, 200 meters or 300 meters out. In this case, we typically ran it with 90 degrees or 180 degrees coverage because we knew where we put in the leak. <coughs> what you see up here, or here, this is uh, the subsea bottle what it looks like. So this is in back play we, we showed. Down here the processing is running in the subsea bottle and it's detecting a possible leak here. And depending on how the system is set up, this is actually what we call the heat map. So this is the three-dimensional accumulation of this, this uh, leak here, which is then being used to escalate to an alarm. So over here you see the topside use interface. So based on this processing subsea, it's deciding, yeah, we have a leak and it's roughly this big. And you can see the size of this red dot here gives the size of the subsea leak, gas leak. And the range bearing, so this is range bearing. Here you can see we ran the system with 180 degrees coverage. So this is what you would like to see. Uh, no leaks uh, detected, and then this is what you don't want to see. So you see here is detecting a leak, and then what we can do, we can request a QA image from the acoustic uh, or from the subsea template or subsea uh, system. So you press and press a, a one of the uh, buttons here, and then it will upload a little bit more data. And in principle, you can upload the full raw data if you had enough bandwidth on your acoustic modem but that's very challenging. So that's why we've done a lot of decimation in, in this case. 
So in conclusion, this uh, presentation is uh, we, we achieved a roughly two times increase in the performance in the shallow water test environment. So we, we can have uh, water in water test, fresh water in salt water as a proxy for oil. We, we get more than 110 meters for relevant flows, in this case 40 liters per minute. We know that oil is roughly at least 10 decibel easier to detect, so we expect that this is a very conservative figure. The smallest tested flow is 2 liters per minute, and um, we could detect it at tens of meters. And the limitation there is that it's mixing into the wallet water column. So with real oil leaks, we will probably get quite a bit more than that. Gas detections in shallow water in excess of 450 meters. So again, a doubling of performance. And um, <clears throat> it's very clear that narrow beams, both in reception and transmission, is crucial for the quality of detection and, and the processing robustness. Vertical steerability is necessary in order to uh, to have sufficient low false alarms. Alarms needs to be processed in 3D slash 4D uh, to make sure that uh, that it's actually again it's uh, it's it's not uh, it's not coming up with false alarms. Then we've chosen to minimize the environmental impact uh, using uh, frequencies higher than 180 kilohertz. The marine mammal vocalization band is uh, regulated in certain areas up till 160 kilohertz. So we choose to not drop the frequency uh, further down than uh, than around the 200. So 180 to 220 was typical what we ran this system on. And then we demonstrated the full autonomy in an offshore environment, uh, also 2014, with battery operation and the modems and everything. So that was uh, the presentations I, I had uh, I had in mind, and then maybe we should open up for some questions or clarifications. Thank you, Mr. Peter.